speakers who I think is really amazing. We've got folks lined up for the whole year through the end of the spring. Um, so thanks so much to everybody who has made this possible, um, everyone who suggested speakers. And I'm not sure if Julio is here, but Julio has done an amazing job and will continue to do an amazing job. So thank you, Julio. Um, after today, we have seven more talks this quarter. Um, there are posters up around the department. Uh, there's a seminar series page on our website. You'll get email reminders. Um, for the folks who are here who are enrolled in the course, you know that you'll be coming back week after week. Um, today is an exception, but normally the talks are going to be at 2 p.m. downstairs in 5011, so right below us. Just a quick plug for uh, the talk next week. So our next speaker on Friday, October 11th, is Megan Finn. Um, Meg is an assistant professor from the School of Information at the University of Washington. Uh, she does work on crisis informatics, and her talk is We Are All Well, A Partial History of Public Information Infrastructures After Disasters. Um, so Dr. Finn's faculty host is Bill Tomlinson. Are you around, Bill? Hey, Bill. Um, so Bill's been passing around a sign-up sheet. If you're interested in um, meeting with Dr. Finn or getting a meal, um, keep an eye out for that. Sounds good. Okay, so the other thing that I want to do before passing off the floor is to kick off what I hope is a kind of fun new tradition. Um, so we're trying this thing where at the start of the seminar talks, we take a minute to do a quick announcement about some of the recent accomplishments in the department. Um, our faculty and our grad students do so many amazing things here in informatics, but often we don't really know what our colleagues are up to day to day. So this is a chance for us to kind of learn about what's happening in the department and celebrate together. <coughs> Um, thank you to everybody who sent me their recent accomplishments over email. It's actually really daunting. You're all doing really amazing things, so thank you. Um, for the sake of time, I tried to pare back a little bit and just include one thing from each person who messaged me. Um, if you have recently published something or had something accepted or gotten a grant, any of those exciting things, uh, and you don't see it up here today, just send me a quick email and I'll be sure to get you on the list for a future, future talk. Um, this is a little cheesy, but grad students, if you're in the room and uh, we announce one of your accomplishments, would you mind standing up so that we can applaud for you at the end? Thanks. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to run through these um, so you get a sense of what's been happening. So, Fatima Akbar with Gloria Mark published a paper in Sensors titled an empirical study comparing unobtrusive physiological stress sensors for stress detection in computer work. I think maybe let's clap for everybody at the end, because otherwise you'll get tired of clapping. You're all awesome. Um, Max Collins and Sonia Gupta completed uh, UX research internships this summer at Facebook. Amanda Cullen and Kat Brewster, with myself, published an article in uh, Critical Studies and Media Communication on cultural debates around women's breasts in video game live streaming. Yao Du received a student startup fund micro grant from the UCI Beale Applied Innovation uh, Group to support user testing of her prototype, which is called Voice Guardians. Daniel Epstein had a workshop paper accepted to CSCW titled Designing to Provide Social Support to Job Seekers After Prison Release. Nagar Gorbani, Joshua Garcia, and Sam Malik had a paper accepted to the International Conference of Software Engineering titled Detection and Repair of Architectural Inconsistencies in Java. I apologize for names. I'll work on getting better at names. Rahana Jabar Jabarvan was selected to participate in Rising Stars 2019, an academic career workshop for women in electrical engineering and computer science. Alfred Kosa and Yao Li had a paper accepted for the Journal of the Association for Information Science and Technology titled Context and Privacy Concerns in Friend Request Decisions. Ian Larson was awarded a fellowship for his archival research at the Strong Museum of Play. Jun Wei, Rahena Jabarvand, and Sam Malik had a paper accepted to the Conference of Automated Software Engineering titled Test Transfer Across Mobile Apps Through Semantic Mapping. Gloria Mark received an NSF Future of Work grant for her project titled Intelligent Facilitation for Teams of the Future via Longitudinal Sensing in Context. Melissa Masmanian received two NSF grants to support informatics grad students, one on STEM education that supports Phoebe Chu's dissertation work, and one on independent workers that supports Hilary Abraham. 
Sam McDonald, along with Melissa, had a paper accepted to CSCW titled Information and Materialities of Citizen Com Communication in the U.S. Congress. Kylie Pepper just, Pepler just welcomed a number of new staff and students and postdocs to the Creativity Labs. Nipur Raval had a paper accepted to CSCW titled Making a Pro, Professionalism After Platforms in Beauty Work. Eugenia Rowe with Melissa had a paper accepted to CSCW titled Hashtag Burnout, an experimental study investigating how political hashtags shape reactions to news content. And finally, Spencer Ruelas published a review of a recent book, Sexuality and Role Playing Games, in the journal Sexualities. <coughs> I see none of you stood, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> but let's give everyone a round of applause. <laughs> so without further ado, I'll pass things over to Audrey. Now you know what's coming already, that's not okay. <laughs> okay, I think I'm officially good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you both. That was awesome. Um, really like that introduction. Um, I really like the tone that it's setting. Um, I think we should continue that time. So, so thank you. Um, so this is the annual state of the department. Um, it's the part where Andre has a sleepless night the night before um, because he has to put together this presentation. Um, at the same time, it's, it's much of the same, right, kind of celebrating what we do, but then also looking forward to, to where, we, where we are going. So um, I know that this is by popular demand. <laughs> um, many of you did not get to witness this as as wonderfully so as some of our staff did. So let's see if this actually plays. Oh, come on, it's got to play. Why is it not playing? It always plays. It played when I was here a half hour ago. Um, all right, so what you would see... It's technology, what can I do? Um, I would, you know what, probably when I take it off of the big screen, it will play just fine. But anyways, what you will see is that water is bubbling up through here. It's not bubbling up, it's bubbling up very fast. Um, the trash cans are here to try to catch some of it because the rest of it is actually outflowing into the hallway. Right? So for those of you who see the, the stuff cut, that's, that's what's going on. Um, this is the second one. Um, you can see water coming down, down the stairwell here. Um, again, I, I can, you know, I'll leave my left through here a little bit, people can watch. Um, and there's one more where you again can see the raindrops coming down the stairs and you can see how wet it is down there. Um, for those of you who want to know what happened, um, somebody on the seventh floor moved a valve open um, and they believe that that is simply by accident, not on purpose, so let that be known. Um, the valve was not closed and so there's about 80 psi pressure on that water coming through, and so when the water came, it started to fl overflow. The normal way for that overflow to go through is down the kitchen sinks. Right, that's all good, except when there's a little blockage below your floor, and it starts coming back up. Um, and so at some point there was just too much water going on, and um, we've all seen what the effect of that is. Um, there was some question because there was another building that this happened to on campus two days earlier. Um, that was a completely different incident. Okay? That's actually where a four inch pipe burst. Um, and that created a lot more damage than what we experienced. So, 
Anyways, that was the entertainment about a week and a half ago. Then we all got to see the fans. Then we all got to see the people cutting things away. Um, it will all be rebuilt. We will have our kitchen back at some moment in time. Um, I, I kind of want to ask for upgrades. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> the kitchen. The kitchen. Uh, but somehow I don't think that's actually going to happen. Um, so, but anyways, yeah. I was walking around with Mario's for a little while, and he goes, oh, the building is a total loss. We need to build a new one. <laughs> <laughs> I was with him on that, actually. But, but you know, it, it is what it is. So, um, <clears throat> but where I can't play the videos, I, as I said, I'll, I'll leave them up for you. Um, so the usual outline is always a little bit of campus and school news, uh, lots of department news. I always like to have the accomplishments highlighted. By no means can I highlight every single accomplishment. Um, and then talk a little bit about the year ahead and what I see happening. So campus news. This is actually quite remarkable. I've been doing this for a number of years now. And every time this number gets lower and lower, which in this case is actually a really good thing. Um, we're really, really privileged to be at UCI. Okay, so UCI, as a university, if we're thinking that we're the number one best college in the U.S., according to somebody else, the number one university doing the most for the American dream, i.e. upward economic mobility. Um, and, and as one example, Marios actually gave a little update um, at noon, uh, which is partly why this talk was an hour later, um, talked about our undergrads. And about a third of our undergrads graduate with a salary six figures or higher. That's what they self-report. Okay. Half of our undergrads um, are first to college, right? And so you can see what we do as, in this particular case, just ICS. These numbers are for ICS for upward economic mobility. That's what plays into this particular ranking. Uh, the number three best value college, according to Forbes, with the number one among public universities. The number one coolest school, we're back at the top, uh, doing the most for environment and sustainability. Um, the number nine best public university. So over the time that I've been here, almost actually 20 years, almost 20 years now, um, the whole narrative around UCI has changed very, very significantly in terms of its reputation, not just within the UC system or California, but actually nationally and internationally. Um, and I, I'm really proud of you know being part of that, doing my little part and everybody else doing, doing their little part. Now the question is number one, so how long can we stay there? But for a little while we'll roll this and, and we're, we'll be happy with it. Okay, the other bits of news today, um, for those of you who saw, the Chancellor announced a $2 billion fundraising campaign. Um, so the campus has not always been great about fundraising. Um, it is, under the new leadership, has, has become a much more significant focus of the Chancellor, um, the deans, and everybody else. Um, and we've seen that in a number of large naming gifts, including the $200 million um, Health Sciences, College, College of Health Sciences. Um, we're now riding that towards the next wave. So there's a $2 billion goal to be closed in five years. Um, and today was the kickoff of that, and the whole machinery has been set in motion. A lot of that will go to student support. Um, some of it will go to new buildings, obviously, but it is, by and large, a lot about research and fellowships and scholarships. So that's, that's one of the underlying uh, bits there. Other campus news, construction of IACB, the building that's going up over there, um, is progressing. Um, so this is the uh, interdisciplinary science and engineering building, which really is the physics, engineering, and a little bit of ICS building. Um, and so we as a department actually will, in all likelihood, not move anybody there. Um, but some of CS or, and or some of statistics will move there, um, which releases some of the pressure on this building. This building is getting very full very quickly. Um, for those of you who saw the new, new middle or third dorms expansion is open, um, I mentioned that because one of the things that the campus is actually trying to do is have more students be on, on, on campus. It's cheaper. Um, it also creates a very different experience. So the goal is about 60% of our students to live on campus, and slowly but surely um, we're reaching that goal, which is good. Um, and then this last line, UC Path is coming. Um, that's a little bit of an ominous line. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, too. So the UC is moving to a, a standardized system of handling all appointments. That includes all of your appointments as well. All of your salary, um, all of your, you know, I'm now a TA, I'm now a reader, I'm now this, I'm now that. Um, and that system is coming, of course, as a large information technology system onto this campus. 
if there's any department that knows what happens when a large <laughs> information system comes on campus, we are the ones. Uh, we can expect some glitches, and we can expect some, uh, some problems. We can expect that some of you may or may not get paid at some moment in time. I'm not trying to scare you. What I'm trying to say is be on top of the messages that come out about UC Path. Right? So there are requests to make sure that you're registered. There are requests to make sure that you have dual authentication signed up and all those kinds of things. Make sure you do do that. Make sure that when it's the first of the month and you expect your paycheck, you actually look. Um, and if you don't see it, come to Marty, come to me, um, and we try to figure out what we can do that. I'm not trying to make it too scary, but there are as with any big rollout, I expect there to be some problems. Hopefully not in our school, but hopefully nowhere on campus. Um, but the reality is that there will be something uh, that will go wrong at some moment in time. Just let us know. Um, we are on your side. Okay? Marty and I are you know, always trying to solve problems, and this is what we do, and we'll get on the phone and we'll see what work we can do. Uh, student numbers. So the campus had, again, a record number of applicants, 95, almost 96,000. Admitted 25,000, 6,250 accepted, which is 250 more than the year before. Um, total transfer applicants, a little bit up, but you can see that there's about 500 more transfer applicants that said, yes, I'll come to UCI. Um, so again, the number of new students coming in is about 6,000, um, almost 10,000. So it's actually quite a bit of new students. The campus is reaching its growth limit, uh, but <coughs> Admissions is always tricky, right? You make an offer and they might say yes or no. Turns out that a lot more say yes than, than we may, might have anticipated this year. So there'll be lots of students on campus. School news. Um, the dean has really put an emphasis on graduate student growth. Um, so part of his plan over the next five, six years is to go from about 250 PhD students to about 400. So we're actually almost 300 to about 400 not just in our department, but across the three departments. Um, partly because he sees, and rightly so, um, PhD students and research master students really are the engine of the research that happens at the university. Um, and so if we want to think about our reputation as a school, investing in that engine is actually one of the ways that the dean sees the school's reputation to further grow. That comes with an emphasis on further faculty growth. Uh, the dean expects us to be at 120 at some moment in time, probably in the next five years. There's lots of hiring that happened last year. Uh, eight new faculty joined. Three others will be joining shortly. Um, there will again be hiring this upcoming year and the following year and the following year. So this goes hand in hand, right? So more students need more faculty to, to be able to uh, advise in, et cetera. Uh, staff development. Um, I don't know why I said staff development, but really what I meant, staff. Um, so there is significant changes at the school level in terms of staff. There's additional staff that's being hired in support of this. Uh, so we have a new senior financial director. Uh, we have a couple of people on the fundraising side who've been doing a lot of work uh, working with companies, and we're starting to see the effects of that. Uh, I think the people running the capstone courses are seeing actual referrals now where companies come in through the fundraising folks rather than at the last minute, I know Darren and Hadar are sitting there. Um, at the last minute, usually they're like, anybody, any projects? And we don't see so many of those messages anymore because there's more that come. Uh, moreover, those companies are starting to donate money in association with the campus, uh, with those courses. So they're happy. We send out the request and say, you know, you're, we're happy. Do you want to give maybe a little bit of money? And some of that money is coming our way. But that we then will further invest in the educational experience of the undergrads. So that's a, that's a useful cycle that's happening there. And then at the school, also the website, the website is always the problem, uh, <laughs> but at the school certainly has been a very old, old website, and the, the entire website is being redone at this moment by a professional website design company. Um, so we can expect a real website with real content um, that is logical, that we can all navigate properly. The informatics website will be housed underneath that. Whether or not it will change its look is unclear at this moment in time, but we have lots of good content that we'll be able to transfer anyways. And we also have actually an undergraduate fellow this year um, who's going to help the department maintain its website and do a whole bunch of stuff in collaboration with Bill and myself uh, to make sure that the content stays up to date. So happening at school level, 
Also at the school level, there's an ICS industry showcase on October 16. This is the first time this is being held. Again, in, in connection with these companies now circling ICS, there's been a desire to build a little bit bigger event than just the showcase for us, or the showcase for computer game science, or the showcase for... So consolidating the ability of companies to come, to speak to our students, um, to hold a little bit of a resume fair, to connect it to ICS Day, which is the undergrads celebrate. Um, and it's become more of an event where companies go, hey, I want some like this as well. Can I be the lunchtime speaker? And so that little jealousy inducing you want to be part of it is really good for our reputation with the local and, and global industry. There are some operational changes in terms of how the budget works. Um, so what comes my way versus what stays at the dean's office, those, those are positive and the same at the staff uh, staff site that you know there's more staff around there's a redistribution of some of the work what happens in the department what happens uh, at the school level uh, but all of that is being done in collaboration with the department chair so that's all moving moving well and then last uh, for the school news research incentive awards the Dean um, has been investing in actual research so taking dollars that are part of the budget and putting out a call for research proposals. Um, there's a class of up to, I think, $300,000 for two years. There's a class up to seventy-five, dollars and there's a class up to $10,000. Uh, last year, uh, the dean intended to uh, hand out one of the major ones, two of the medium, and four of the small ones. I believe he ended up giving out one of the large ones, four or five of the medium ones, and at least 12 of the small ones. So there's a real desire to invest in the research um, and catalyze the research before it goes to the National Science Foundation or the NIH or other places so that we can do some of the pre-work that needs to be in these proposals. Um, that call will come out again this fall. I encourage all of us to think about that. Um, usually for individual PIs, the smaller ones are supporting a workshop that you want to put together and then I'll highlight a couple of those in a little bit. Uh, for the larger ones, it usually is looking at sort of more interdisciplinary or at least cross-disciplinary within the department kind of, kind of work. So put your thinking caps on because, of course, everybody bid on the first round. And usually my experience is that when the second round comes about, they don't give it to the same people. So if you didn't necessarily, so and that's not a hard, hard and fast rule, but just something to think about. If you didn't put a proposal in last time, think about it this time. And that's all specifically directed at faculty. But then for faculty, you know, get your grad students involved in writing them because that is, of course, outstanding experience for, for them as well. All right, so campus undergraduate admissions. If I break them down, those 6,000 students, um, this is the number of students that are actually showing up. So we see that ICS, in terms of freshmen, has gone down. That's partly because the number of transfer students is up and partly because the school is trying to manage how many students are actually in our classes. Right? So one of the things that some of you, or the majority of you, have experienced in the especially lower division courses, but even in our upper division courses, is a significant increase in the number of students that are coming in those courses. So teaching a course of 200 is fairly routine at this moment in time. And so there's a conscious effort to sort of top off how many students come into ICS because we, we can teach larger classes than that. Uh, but you can see certainly compared to some of the other schools, like social science is huge, but um, we are certainly getting up there with the larger schools uh, at this moment in time. If we break that down into uh, degree programs, the red ones are the ones that we care about as a department. Uh, we can see that you know we always get relatively small numbers of first year students, and even for transfer students, not necessarily large numbers. The majority of the students prefer computer science, and I'll explain <coughs> that number in just a little bit. Um, what happens, though, is that many students come in as computer science, then they take one of our courses, and they go, hey, that's something that I like, and they end up switching majors. This is how we graduate 70 or 80 informatics majors every year when there's you know, four freshmen coming in. Um, and that's just one of the effects that's there, because they just don't know what informatics is when they're in high school. And that's okay. This number went down significantly uh, as part of you know, the control of how many students were coming in, and also as part of recognizing that, again, there's a lot of transfer students that were being admitted uh, into computer science this year. So that's campus and school. Let's talk a little bit about the department. That's, after all, what we're here for. Um, stuff that happened in the past year, 
uh, both in terms of personnel and, and in terms of other kinds of things. So Alfred Copes and Bonnie Nardi retired. Um, I did see Alfred earlier. Uh, he, was, he was hanging out, so he seems to have a great time. Um, and Bonnie as well, and last time I talked to her, but you know, they made significant contributions to our department, and I feel like the year that you retired, you deserve to be sort of the first light from the, from the department update that we acknowledge everything that you, that you have done. Of course, when people retire, there's also new people that come in. Um, Sean, I think I saw you walking in the bath. There he is, Sean Young, um, is, has joined us as a, I learned, 49.5% in our department <laughs> and 50.5% in emergency medicine, which is great for us to build a bridge with the health sciences, right? Um, so Sean, welcome. And then Alberto Cronin Martins will be joining us uh, January 1st as a lecturer in software engineering. Um, and he is most interesting because actually what he has is his background. He's got a PhD in astrophysics and a PhD in astronomy, I believe. And so turns out that what he's been doing with that has been building lots of large software systems that simulate and measure all sorts of different things. And he has a great, um, great knowledge of software engineering um, and so he'll be joining us, but as part of his lecture appointment, it's very clear that he's also going to be hanging out with some of the people in physics, and there's some hope that we will actually elevate him to a regular faculty position sometime in the future, um, whether or not split. Melanie, I think I saw you in the room as well. Melanie has joined us as a new staff member. Um, she takes care of all the academic personnel process for at the faculty level, um, and then also sort of the co point of contact for all of the appointments of all the visitors that come our way. You don't do it all by yourself, but you do some of it uh, together with Adriana, who I don't think is here today. But, but welcome. We need more staff in the department to manage everything that we're doing. Um, this is the group that was vice chairs last year. They're still vice chairs this year, Bill, Yunan, and Melissa. So Mo, for most of you in the room, Melissa is your point of contact. She is spending some time away this fall. Um, so she's here, and then she's not here. She's here, and then she's not here. She sent an email when she's here. She's happy to um, talk with you, have you in the office hours, and et cetera. Um, if she's not there, you have an urgency issue, come to me. Um, my office is open, as I always say. We will have two open faculty positions this year. And this is always the annual call. We're going to need everybody's help in convincing people to come here. Uh, there's one open position in human computer interaction and design, um, and there's one in health informatics, and I say with a slight twist. Uh, part of what we're asking for in the health informatics is with a connection to some of the existing work that we do in the department. So whether it's a health informatics that bridges to CCW, health informatics that bridges to software, health informatics that bridges to HCI, health informatics that maybe bridges to digital media and learning. Um, a little bit of bridge building people is something that we would like to like to see in the department. So those two positions are uh, almost posted. I know the last signatures are happening. And then I'll let people know and then you can blast all your channels so we get lots of good applicants. Um, there is oh, at least one and uh, possibly two other recruitments that will be happening there. Um, I'm not putting them on here because we're handling them slightly differently. There's also one or two additional lecturers. Um, we have permission to hire a lecturer in software engineering and a lecturer in HCI. Um, partly software engineering and, um, associated with the Master of Software Engineering, HCI, because one of the folks that, uh, that used to teach in HCI is now our Vice Provost and Graduate Dean. Um, and so we have a little bit less, less capacity, um, and so that's one of the things that we'll be putting forward. We are looking at um, continuing uh, to hire additional staff. There is actually a grad undergrad coordinator that I want to hire. Um, and the grad coordinator would do things like all of the TA and reader appointments, but then also do a lot of coordination work around fellowships, for instance. And fellowships is one of the things that we don't, um, we don't sort of manage in-house, and I would like to manage that much more in-house so that we can build a record of which ones succeeded, which ones didn't, have examples. Um, have somebody who pokes you know, me for the additional letter because there's only 30 minutes left and we really need your letter. Um, and so somebody who helps with that, somebody who helps collect your independent mentorate or your IDPs, your independent development plans that you're meant to fill out with your advisor. And so somebody who really is not a student affairs person saying these are the classes you can take, these are not, uh, but is much more on the operational side and supports the grad students uh, as much as possible. And then Gisette, I think I saw you in the room somewhere. Where are you? Oh, there you're hiding over there. <laughs> Gisette, Gisette will be our diversity ambassador this year. Um, 
thank you for doing that. Um, it's the third year that we are self-funding as a department this position. It's really meant to reach out to other universities um, and you know, essentially lay out the red carpet, but build, build connections with those universities and, and tell, us what, tell them what informatics is about and what you can learn about informatics here at UCI and even beyond as well. I think part of the service that we're doing is even just teaching about graduate school and, and, and what that might entail and how you put together an application. Even if you don't end up applying with us, but you end up applying elsewhere, maybe you do a really great job and you come to us as a faculty member. So I feel like it, it's a service that we're doing to, to everybody. Okay, other department news. Um, this is probably one of the greatest set of alumni that's there. This is uh, Richard Taylor, Dick Taylor. Um, he was one of the faculty members here. Um, this year, um, over the past year, sort of all of these folks got together um, and built a fund out of which now the Richard and Taylor Graduate um, Award is funded on an annual basis. And so when I send out a call for fellowship applications a couple of days ago, um, these are the folks that funded that specific award. And that's going to be set at a level of 5,000 this year. It's going to be that level in the upcoming years as well. It's going to be building an endowment so that every year the payment, payment comes out, that every year this award is, is there. Um, and these are your fellow former PhD students who, who made that happen. So I'm, I'm super excited to be able to announce that. Um, and all of them were, of course, advised by Dick in this particular case. This is the other picture. Um, this one I like very much as well. This is Rosalva. Um, Rosalva is another one of our alumni, one of our PhD alumni. She herself uh, was the beneficiary of a Miguel Velez Fellowship when she was a PhD student here, which was a one-time $10,000 that she received from that fellowship uh, program. Um, and when you ask her, she said, what did you do? Well, I flew home, because her parents are, are in Peru. I bought a car, right? Those are all the kinds of things that actually made life possible um, here in Irvine. But she was so grateful for that that she came back to us and said, I would like to extend this to other people. Um, and so she is committed for the next five years to pay $10,000 um, in the Resolva Gallardo um, Graduate Award. Um, that, again, is something that you can apply to. Um, and it's a little bit specific to software engineering. Um, but she's giving back to you all um, what, she, what she has that benefit. What's nice is that she's funding the $10,000. Um, Google is matching 6,000. Over those five years, we'll have 30,000. Um, and we're trying to turn that into a larger endowment by actually now rallying around her gift to build a larger fellowship so that there's another fellowship that's continuously giving. Rather than five years, it's going to be much longer. Um, and this was only last week, uh, so we had, a, we had a fabulous time talking, talking with her, and you see the results. And then in my email, there's three other fellowships that all of you are eligible for. Um, and then there was one that came out from the school that a number of you are eligible for as well. Um, and all I can say is, you know, if you feel like you match one of these fellowships, you might want to think about applying. Okay? Work with your advisor. Make sure that they're aware that you're applying. Um, make sure that the application is in tip-top shape because people like Resolva are actually reading it. Um, and people like Dick are reading it. They're not making the decisions because the university actually doesn't necessarily let them make the decisions. Um, but they will give their input onto the fellowship program. And, you know, I did have a conversation with somebody a number of years ago where they said, mm, you know, those fellowship applications, they're a little, you know, the English was not so good, and this is, you know, and, and so they didn't read that well. And so since then, you know, we've been pushing a little bit harder on the quality of those. And that person has come back and said, wow, the, uh, the past two years has been amazing, right? And, and they're now bought into the university, and we're working on something much larger with them. Um, and so you are often, as students, the first inroads to people who might want to donate uh, more significant funds to the university. So think about that. Put your best foot forward. There's amazing work that's happening in our department um, that speaks to a lot of people on the outside. Um, and we're hoping to do a lot more of this kind of work in the upcoming years. <laughs> My favorite, the orange wall. Um, you know, from the Netherlands, orange has a good color. Um, this is the first incoming class for the Master of Software Engineering. Okay, so the Master of Software Engineering is a new self-supporting program um, that Krista Loach, I don't think you're here, um, and Connie and others have been putting together uh, over the past three years, four years. All the efforts have gone into that. 
Uh, it's real now. This is a, a basement room in ICS-1. It's not the most fabulous room. <laughs> But this is where they're setting up shop. Uh, my understanding is they're, they're, well, my understanding is that they're so far working really hard. It's a first quarter that's actually quite different. It's not your traditional classes. It's self-driven learning. It's kind of like a boot camp kind of experience that you might get outside of the university. Um, but what it does is it brings everybody's programming skills up to a level that then allows them to get into the regular courses on a more equal basis. And the interesting thing is that many of them are not necessarily computer science students as an undergrad. Um, they, are, uh, they have psychology, they have English, they have a whole bunch of different degrees with an interest in computing. They already have done some programming. They might be thinking about switching careers. Some of them just want to build further um, their resume. And they're all in this big melting pot sitting there working away under the, under the supervision of folks. So the first class is here. It's super exciting. Um, this is one of the programs that we've been working on for many years. And we're glad it's here. And then, of course, uh, the opposite side of it. Steve, where are you? Jillian, over there. Um, this, is, this is Renee Reed. Um, she was the commencement speaker just a few weeks ago, actually, again. Is it only a few weeks ago? Um, over MHCID program, which is the other self-supporting uh, program, um, where some 34 students, I think, this year graduated. Um, very happy. She gave one of the best commencement speeches that I've heard in a really, really long time. It was a real honor to actually sit next to her. And, uh, you know, this program just continues to roll along and attract both amazing <coughs> students, but also, again, interest from the outside industry in working with the students and hiring the students. Uh, are we still in a 100% hiring rate? Give More or, or less? Give or take, huh? Yeah. Well, close to 100% is pretty awesome anyways, but... Um, there's, there's a lot of effort that goes into actually making sure that they get the opportunities that, they, that they're looking for. Um, this is a, just a quick graphic. So this is ICS-1, fourth floor, um, which is the white building over there. That's not the engineering tower. So all this space here um, has been allocated to the department um, and is going to, starting December 1, be demolished and be completely renovated. Because for those of you who actually know this building, this hallway is walking around this way, and so the hallway is going to be moved um, to make room for multiple faculty offices and to make room for lots, not lots of lab space, but a good amount of lab space over there. There's a couple of huddle rooms, a conference room, a real kitchen, um, and so this is going to be additional space that the department will have that's renovated, which is again going to alleviate some of the pressure um, that we're having in Donald Brent Hall in terms of where do we house everybody. That also means that temporarily, Andre students who are here and Krista students who are there um, are going to come back to Bren Hall um, on the fifth floor. So we'll be a little, little squeezed. Um, and so we're going to be mo moving some folks around. Um, I think most of the grad students stay put. Um, but we're going to be moving some folks around to have that room for them to be there until somewhere May or June when all this is done. And then a bunch of folks will actually move over there. Um, and then, uh, also on the department news, what is Connected Learning? Well, this is the Connected Learning Lab. Um, the Connected Learning Lab is a now what's called pre-ORU, we can even say ORU, Organized Research Unit on campus. Um, we more or less incubated much of that within the department uh, under the leadership of Mimi Ito. Um, it now is uh, going to be a campus-funded center, so it's going to have its own stream of revenue from the campus. Um, it has its conference right as we speak over in the Student Affairs Center at the moment. Um, and it's, it's an example of how small things grow bigger on this campus. Right? So um, it is now an organized research unit with over 30 affiliated faculty um, from ICS, from informatics, um, from education, um, from sociology, social, uh, social science, and other places. And so it's really uh, moving. It's, a, it's an amazing operation. Um, and I love watching how they're pushing the agenda forward. Um, also for the department, undergraduate enrollment, it's all just slightly up, 240 informatics majors. You know, that's not bad when you start with four a year, right? Um, 193 software engineering majors, 235 computer game science, 131 business information management. We're still a little bit dwarfed by computer science, which is 2,200 undergrads, um, and that's okay. Um, yet many of those undergrads actually we find in our classes, right? When we teach software design or when we teach ACI, there's lots and lots of, of computer science students in there. and We welcome them and we're happy that they come, come take our classes. At the graduate level, uh, we're now at 58 PhD students in the informatics PhD, 
21 in the soft engineering PhD, so almost 80 <coughs> PhD students um, that we have. We'll be growing that a little bit in the upcoming years, I guess. Um, the MHAD program is 34 students. I forgot to list the MSWE. Uh, that's okay. Um, again, CS is about 173 PhD students, so a little bit bigger, about 100 students more uh, larger. Um, but again, we are working on uh, working with you, building a, building a great cohort of students that are coming through. So then the, then the part that I like the most, um, which is where I get to do what Bo just did, which is to celebrate what, what all that goes on. Um, and that means always a, a, a walk back in time, but also means I have to spy a little bit on my computer. Um, because I don't always remember all the full details. So Lucy um, got the Zonta Women in Technology Scholarship. Um, so what happened was there is a Zonta organization, it's a national organization, it's broken up into smaller organizations, broken up into chapters. There's a chapter in Newport Beach. Um, I sent out the call, Lucy sent the application, um, and was chosen as the recipient. The part that's really nice is that I know some of the people in that organization, and one of them said to me, wow, I finally understand what informatics is, because Lucy gave <laughs> such a great talk <laughs> that I now really understand what you're actually talking about when you're talking to me, Andre. So, so Lucy, where are you? Um, yeah, there you are. Could you just do all my state of departments from now on so everybody <laughs> understands what's going on? Uh, but yeah, congratulations. Um, it's awesome. And, and good luck on the next round, right, because you, you go up, uh, up in level. Um, Gisette, I think I, I already put you up, but I'm, I'm going to put you up again. Um, you got the community-based research fellowship um, from the Newkirk Center, um, and particularly for the work in working with Alzheimer uh, patients and understanding um, sort of the challenges that are there as, as you grow older. Um, and I think the, the interesting part of the narrative there is that it, it echoes a lot of how we think, rather than technology for those folks, it's designing the technology with those folks, right, and designing the technology with whom we uh, with, with the audience for whom we're, we're targeting them. So, so congratulations on that. Um, Mark, I, I warned him that he was here, so he promptly ran away right before the talk. Um, <laughs> so now he had to go. Um, again, more community-based uh, design for his work um, on uh, the, the, what's called the Makapo Aquatics Project, which is a charity um, that supports, um, in this case, uh, supported rowing. Um, and rowing for people who, necessary, who couldn't necessarily see, and thus, in this particular case, Mark helped build navigational systems for them. Um, and he got the Graduate Student uh, Great Partner Award, right? So, which is for this organization who's helping us in this, in this space. Um, Adriana and Yao, Yao, are you here? Nope, Yao's not here. Um, actually, she's probably at the CLL, haha. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> They got second place at the AMIA Student Design Challenge uh, for work that Yao started, dragged my student Adriana in, um, which is exactly what we like to see in our department, right? These kinds of collaborations, because there was, there was the original idea, there was a lot of technology that needed to be developed, a lot of, a lot of back and forth between the two of them. Um, and Yao is actually taking that small idea that went to the, to the design challenge and now is doing this as her dissertation topic, um, which I think is awesome. Uh, Dan, um, Dan was awarded the ARC Scholar uh, last year. So the ARC Scholarship um, is an amazing scholarship put together by uh, the Achievement Award for College Scientists, something like that, um, where it is again a fellowship, um, and as part of the fellowship, you're invited to an awesome dinner, and you are, you have a, a faculty or a, you have a, uh, a host who interacts with you on a regular basis. And our department actually has had lots of these fellowship recipients over the, over the many years, partly, again, because of the narrative and the stories that we tell around our work. Um, and then this year, um, got that squeezed in right in there, Amanda um, is the next ARCS Fellowship Award recipient. Um, so that's just amazing. Um, so other things that are happening. Um, I mentioned the Dean's uh, Research Awards, and Bo, you were one of the recipients of that Dean's Research Award. Uh, put together the Inclusive Streaming Initiative, and I think it's initiative with TI in between there. <laughs> so it's I apologize thing, for stealing yes. that. We, we <laughs> so fixed it. We you fixed, fixed it, we but did. the image that I found <laughs> was older, so the blame lays entirely with me here. Um, but it was a fabulous workshop bringing people together. Um, to talk about um, essentially harassment on streaming platforms. Um, and so uh, there's lots of additional outflow from that particular workshop, but it's exactly what it's meant to do is the, these smaller grants are meant to 
start these conversations and then build them out towards larger, larger projects. Uh, the same for Roderick. Uh, he was also funded by one of these Dean's Awards. Um, he put together an event around datafication and community activism, redrawing the boundaries of research. Um, and in sort of talking with Roderick, one of the things that really stood out to me in my, my conversation with him was um, there's, there's a lot of talk about big data and big data being disadvantageous to certain categories of folks. Right? Um, and often the narrative is that who's to blame? What's the big companies? And one of the outcomes of this workshop was, well, actually, a number of folks don't necessarily blame the companies, but they blame academia. Why is academia at fault? Well, we were the ones who invented those algorithms in the first place. Right? So if you invented them and you didn't think about what the unintended consequences are, um, why, why should we trust you? Um, and so I think part of what comes out of that is also, of course, thinking for ourselves. What's our responsibility in this, right, in terms of advancing what goes on? And um, there's a lot of conversation in the department right now around uh, res essentially responsible computing. So what, what can we do as researchers uh, around that notion and try to think of ways of ameliorating some of those unintended consequences, which can be grave consequences? Um, so, so that's a great workshop, and that one will actually happen again. So Roderick's whole goal is to actually build that bridge again, um, and then get folks in to help design the technology that might be, that might be more uh, equitable. Okay, uh, lots of folks got grants. I'm pretty sure I didn't catch everybody, uh, but it was really happy for me to see as department chair because grants are ways in which we fund our PhD students. I can't call them out individually, but just the fact that I was able to put as many faces on there is really good news, especially because most grants will fund our PhD students in the research. Uh, Krista uh, was uh, awarded and recognized as an IEEE Fellow, which is a huge honor in terms of uh, recognition for all the contributions that she's made to the field. Uh, she happened to also get an ACM Distinguished Paper Award, which is uh, a huge honor as well. You don't get those very easily, in, especially in software engineering. Uh, Kai was also elected a fellow, in this particular case, in the American College of Medical Informatics, um, which again is uh, an organization that selects its peers. Uh, that is select from, from among the peers they select the new members. It typically is very uh, exclusive. So congrats to Kai. And then Bonnie, uh, despite the fact that she's retired, <laughs> uh, received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the, the European Society for Socially Embedded Technology. Um, and so she got to fly to Europe and be the recipient of that, which, which just shows you that you know, there's amazing work that happens here, right? And people are being recognized uh, for it. Uh, Gillian equally uh, got an award, and we're going to see the talk. It's called the Sig so Sikai Social Impact Award, I believe so, um, for the work that, you know, again, has social impact. I think the fourth talk this quarter is by Jillian, if I'm not mistaken. Like uh, and in November. So, in November. Okay, yeah. there you go. Uh, so where you get to, you're going, you promised you would give us the talk that you gave at Kai in front of 3,000 people, something like that. Now, 2,000? 500? Two? <laughs> Lots of people. More than, more than we can muster in the department, but at least we get to see your talk. So this is a good thing. Uh, also, Jillian, um, <laughs> just saying, you know, I, I have fun with pictures. <laughs> There's nothing more fun when it gets to be past midnight <laughs> and you're working on your talk and you're looking for pictures of folks, right? Um, so, uh, congratulations on the appointment as, of course, Vice Provost for Graduate Education and Dean of Graduate Division. Um, now we have a direct line. <laughs> to any and all of your problems to be solved instantly? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, but, uh, but anyways, congratulations. That's, uh, that's major recognition. Um, and it also puts graduate division actually in really capable hands, which is a good thing for everybody um, in the room. And then Sam was promoted to be full professor, uh, which is also um, awesome. That's always a good step. And Jeff got to spend uh, twice three months as a CAS fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in Norway, um, where essentially you get to be a researcher like he was meant to be a researcher. Um, you get to be in a small little group. Uh, you get to just only be there with other researchers, maybe 20 of you. 
um, and get to read books, write papers, and do nothing else for three months. Um, and so Jeff was there in, in uh, Norway and has made significant progress on his next book. Other things that happened, uh, so this is the eSports Arena. Um, all of these machines are now somewhere in possession of informatics, one way or another. Uh, so the eSports Arena uh, refreshed all of its computing equipment um, and was kind enough to give all of the old equipment to us. And old equipment to them is still perfectly fine equipment to us. And so uh, I know a number of labs that have benefited from these machines coming in. And it shows you that you can build these kinds of partnerships on campus, which is actually really nice. Um, also eSports, the eSports uh, research conference happened. It will happen again in about a week and a half. The campus continues to get a ton of attention for all of the eSports. So far it's mostly good. We'd like to keep it that way. Um, but uh, it, it, again, it's, uh, it's a way that the campus is distinguishing itself and actually putting in not just the, the, uh, what do you call it, the, the entertainment side and the competitive side of eSports, um, but also investing in building the bridges to the research. And so the, the folks running eSports uh, have been kind enough to work with us to put together the conference, uh, to allow us to study some of the athletes and students in the arena, to allow us to study what goes on. Um, and again, it's a, it's a good, good kind of partnership. Other things that happened, um, this is again one of my favorite pictures. Um, this is, I don't know his name, his name is, yes, Parker. Parker worked with me, so that's why I know his name. Um, Parker and Carlos, who were part of the capstone courses and got hired by IB Tech, right? And so they're in the final year. They weren't necessarily on the IB Tech team, is my understanding. Um, and so part of what happens in the capstone is the companies have a final capstone day, they all see each other. Um, and they look, of course, at the talent that's in the room and the undergrads, and connections get made. And so you can see how the capstone actually makes a really big difference in our students getting, getting future jobs. And that's the undergrads. And also the undergrads, um, this is the winning team from the IEEE GameSig. So for the fifth year in a row, our undergrads uh, won that competition. It's the regional competition, but still, we, we won for the fifth year in a row. Um, these are three students who went to uh, USC, where there's an event called Hack USC, and said, well, you know, we won't hack them, but we'll build a really good app. And so they got first place in mobile app uh, design for this hackathon, where they spent two days uh, uh, at USC, and these are some of our, some of our students. And uh, this is, again, another uh, bit of our undergrad world. Um, so this is Kylie Pepler's class, in Ubiquitous Computing, so you completely read at the class. Um, it's now based with lots and lots of devices. The department bought the devices. Um, now they're in, in place. We can use them. The class is in the Antigua Learning Pavilion, uh, so it made use of the facility that's there, doing lots and lots of group work. Uh, and so the plug that I want to put in is that within reason, uh, you know, if your class needs something special or, or outstanding or some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, what do we call that, materials, the department can help. Um, and so that's one of the things to, to think about. That was not a position in where we in a number of years ago, but certainly as you're thinking about your classes and you think I could use X, um, come, come talk to me. This is, uh, for those of you who've actually been to the Tustin hangers, everybody know the, the big hangers that are there? Um, so this is what the inside looks like. It's bitter cold, it's very dark, um, especially in February I think this was. Um, it was very cold, very dark, um, very empty, um, but ICS decided that it would have its annual uh, festivities there, so we did that, it got all dressed up. Um, and this is the ICS Hall of Fame event, so this is our Dean Mario's. Um, these are four folks, uh, Justin, Jim, uh, I know her name, Aaron, Aaron, come on. Aaron Bratner, um, and Gerald Bordis. And Gerald, actually, I skipped, but it's my student, so I really should know his name. Um, so ICS awards every year a number of our distinguished alumni uh, the recognition of being part of the Hall of Fame. Um, and so this year, there were four recipients, and they all had a history of informatics, uh, which I think just, again, speaks to, A, we like nominating people for things. That is actually hurdle number one. Um, and, you know, plug for you all. If you want to be nominated for something, come talk to us, right? We, we, we want to work on that. Um, and that holds for the grad students, where that grad coordinator that we want to hire can help with fellowships. 
But it equally holds for the faculty that it's important to nominate each other for these kinds of, um, not in this case, these kinds of things, but for opportunities that are there. And when these kinds of opportunities are there regarding our alumni, again, send me names, we'll put together, uh, we'll put together uh, nominations. Um, and then last but not least, I promised, Ernest. Um, so this is Ernest. Ernest is one of our new grad students. Um, and Ernest and I have been talking for two or three years. I think it's about three years where he came into my house the first time and said, yeah, I'm thinking about grad school. And we talked. And then a little bit later, he's like, oh, I'm thinking about grad school. Um, <laughs> I'm just really excited that you're here, you. uh, is one. Um, and uh, I think part of why I want to put your picture up, because Ernest is actually been working in school for a long time. Um, and has been contributing a lot in Charnia's office, the Office of Access and Inclusion, in doing lots and lots of outreach work um, to high school kids, to, under, to uh, elementary school kids, and, and many, many more. Um, and, and Ernest served as the face of that program for, for quite a while. Um, and just to demonstrate that that's the case, there's Ernest, there's lots of people, <laughs> but then the real reason I like Ernest <laughs> is because you all know I like to wear my red hat. <laughs> and I finally have a fellow who likes <laughs> Red Sox. So, uh, kindred spirits here, thank you very much. And, and with permission, because I, I, I asked you before mm -hmm. if I could do this, so, so thank you. Um, year ahead. Okay. Um, what's going on? So what's going on is the Game Design and Interactive Media major. So we have a Computer Game Science major. I talked about it last time. We're transforming it into a Game Design and Interactive Media major. Um, it finally has left all the hurdles of the school. It's currently with the campus. Um, we shoot here this month somewhere, um, whether that's approved or not, and so we're making progress in making that happen. I talked about the space in ICS-1 that's going to be fully refurbished um, with some opportunities for creativity using the resulting space. Right? There's a number of students or a number of students of faculty that will move out. There will be some lab spaces that we can think about what might we want to do with that. I don't have good answers yet, but I'm open to ideas. This one is important, improved TA to student ratios. It's important to faculty, but it's especially important to the students. Um, the dean has made a much better allocation to all of the departments to bring the TA to student ratio down from 61, where it was, to 50. That's a big difference. Right? That's actually a really, really big difference. Um, so that means that starting winter quarter, because our budget just came out, um, we will be able to make better allocations of numbers of students in support of classes. It'll take us a little bit of time, um, but that is happening. And I think that's actually a really, really important uh, statement that he's making. Um, and it's also beneficial to all involved, because I know that those of you who have been running the large classes, you've been working really, really hard um, in keeping up with all the grading that's there. Um, so and this should help with that. Um, also ongoing, so improved budget, certainly on the site of TAs and readers. That's now improved with what's coming from the, from the dean. Uh, also on the site of the self-supporting programs, they've been generating some income from the department. Um, I know that I've poked you. Yes, exactly. But if there's little initiatives that people have, right, just like the dean is liking the little initiatives um, for workshops and other kinds of things, I'm just looking at the grad students. If there's things that you want to do, um, you know, let us know. Talk, talk to me, right? If there's something that you want to have a couple of events where you want to get some faculty together about applying for grad school, right? And you want to do it with lunch, I will sponsor that, right? So there's lots, lots of things that you might be able to think about um, that might be able to tap into that budget a little bit. Um, fundraising, I already showed the uh, Dick, uh, Richard Taylor Award, I already showed the uh, Resolva Award. Um, there's more that we're currently engaged in. Um, I can't say for sure whether they will happen or not, um, but there's a number of bigger irons in the fire that I hope that we might be able to close in the upcoming year and you'll hear about. Um, and then message, what I really mean by that is messaging of the department. Um, there's a really interesting exercise I did with the faculty a uh, number of months ago start of the year last year, where I asked, what, what do you want the world to be, was, was the question asked. And I got lots of lovely answers back um, about, you know, I want the world to be a world where kid, it's safe for kids to be on the internet, um, right? And many of those uh, that I like really as inspiration, I want to find a way to use those either around our floor by putting some of them up on the wall, um, to use this maybe on the website when it gets updated by the professional company. Um, and so anybody who has creative ideas about how we can use you know, those kinds of inspirational statements, uh, come talk to me and we'll figure out something. 
There's, of course, some challenges. I already talked about UC Path. It's coming. Uh, pay attention when there's something that says UC Path. Um, space will the increased size of the department in terms of the number of faculty, number of grad students also leads to increased distances, literally, because people are sitting on the sixth floor, the fifth floor in that building. Um, and now some of you are also sitting in Cal 82 associated with the Connected Learning Lab. Um, but also figuratively, just in terms of, um, you know, many more people to stay in touch with, many more people to understand what they're doing. Um, and so I am always open to trying to find ways in which to lower those hurdles, right? So faculty have coffee hour. I know IGSA has coffee hour. I encourage everybody to participate in that because um, you want to keep that as small as possible. Space also means continuous reorganizing. Um, Marty's favorite activity these days is looking at a spreadsheet and going, okay, this person goes there, that person goes there, and that one goes, nope, that doesn't work, so let me try something else, right? Um, so that's one of the things Marty and I are doing a lot. Um, and then squeeze, even though we're getting some extra space, uh, if we hire two, three, four new faculty and grad students and staff next year, that space goes away very, very quickly. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, how can we more effectively use our lab spaces, for instance, because uh, one of the things that I like, for instance, about the, um, the game space, where Constant and Kurt have their spaces, uh, you know, there's a number of desks that are pre-allocated, but there's a number of them that are just guest desks, right? There's some people that like to work from home, and they'll come, they use one of the hotel spaces, and then they go back. Are those, you know, is, is that a model that we want to put together in some other labs as well, because that might just be more efficient use of space. We're not there yet, um, but, I, but we are looking at sort of what are creative ways for us to use space uh, better. Uh, staff size, you know, I would love to hire five additional staff members to do what, what everybody in the department does, because there's more that we can do to elevate the level of support. Um, but of course, that depends on budget. And, you know, that budget of how many staff we can hire goes really, really slow. Um, and then always, I like to call attention to well-being. Um, I think one of the most important things in our lives is to take care of ourselves before we take care of our work. Um, if we take care of ourselves first, our work tends to be better. Yet we're all academics, so we tend to take care of our work first, and then we think about ourselves. Um, just, just keep paying attention. Lead a, lead a healthy, balanced life. Uh, many of you have heard me say, family and health come first. Um, and I mean that. Um, and you know, I've been in that situation myself before. Um, it's just something that is the most important thing as you go forward. So overall, actually, I'm feeling super positive. Right? I think things are going really, really well for the department. Um, this is the faculty, the staff, the lecturers, everybody else. But then amazing students and amazing community support on the outside. Um, and I feel like we're on a really, really good path. The reputation that we have on campus and outside of campus is really phenomenal. Uh, we need to keep working on that, of course. Um, but we work on that by doing the kind of work that everybody does, the kind of research that you do, because in many ways it speaks for itself. Um, and that is, that is really, really good. Um, and it was actually kind of funny, because over lunch I was sitting across a uh, professor from computer science, and he said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah software engineering, yeah, the core of informatics. And I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> kind of not the way we look at things. Let me talk to you a little while. <laughs> so, and, you know, you just didn't know what, what all was going on for us, right? And, and that's just, there, there is no core. It's, it's an interdisciplinary conglomerate of amazing people um, who are doing very different things, but find work at the intersection that is actually where the, the truly interesting stuff happens. Um, and that's really what our department is about. Um, we're still on the growth trajectory. Um, I think we, we are looking, looking very good at this moment. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can tell that I reused this slide because our Facebook and Twitter don't look like that anymore. <laughs> Paul already actually showed this. Uh, come to the seminar series. There are some fabulous, amazing uh, people that are coming by and enjoy the social hour. As always, we did have now a little coffee beforehand. Thank you both for the idea. Um, so we did not take away the social hour afterwards. Um, so come on downstairs. I'll be there for a little bit. And uh, let's celebrate the year starting. Thank you.